Hello and welcome to Dragon Puppet. My name is Thomas and I recently got my hands on the new Deck of Many Things box set. So in today's video, I want to talk about this iconic Dungeons and Dragons item. It's history over the last 50 years and how best to use it without ruining your campaign. Also, you don't need to drop 80 pounds on the new box set. So at the end of the video, I'm gonna show you some great low cost alternatives so you can include it in your game. All right, so let's get on with the video. Let's start with a quick history. The deck of many things is a powerful magical deck of cards which will bestow either penalties or bonuses on the user depending on which card is drawn. The deck has been part of the game since almost the very beginning, making its first appearance in the 1975 Greyhawk supplement, which was the second D&D release ever published. Here the deck was made up of 18 cards from a standard deck of playing cards. The cards didn't have individual names and the effects were pretty straightforward. In 1979, the Dungeon Master's Guide for Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was released, and the Deck of Many Things was updated. A full Deck of Many Things was now 22 cards, and they more closely resembled the Major Arcana from a standard tarot deck. Although the book does mention that about 75% of the time, a deck is only made up of 13 cards. Issue 77 of Dragon Magazine introduced the Tarot Deck of Many Things in 1983, a one-of-a-kind item which was used to divine fortunes like a typical tarot deck. The article also gave effects depending on if the card was drawn upright or reversed. A few years later, in 1989, the Deck of Many Things reappeared in Dragon 148. This appearance is a bit fluffier and provides some narrative background, giving a possible in-universe explanation for how the deck came into existence. This issue also came with the first physical copy of the Deck of Many Things, which could be cut out and used in-game. A few months later, an adventure was published in Dungeon Magazine issue 19, featuring a dungeon based around the deck. Each of the 22 rooms had a card built into the door, which had to be drawn in order to enter the room. When 3rd edition was released in the year 2000, the Deck of Many Things returned in the Dungeon Master's Guide, basically unchanged but just with a few minor tweaks. Strangely, the Deck of Many Things was absent from the 4th edition Dungeon Master's Guide. This may have something to do with the fact that 4th edition was supposed to be more balanced and approachable to new players, a concept which doesn't gel too well with the high stakes consequences and chaotic nature of the Deck of Many Things. But it wasn't absent for long, as two years later an updated version of the deck appeared in Dungeon Magazine 177, including new rules and new printable art for the deck. This may have been the most powerful version of the deck of many things that we've ever seen, as this version had a mind of its own, seeking to sow chaos and cause disruption. The deck could also be used as an implement to cast spells for sorcerers, and granted buffs to the owner without them even having to draw cards. The deck of many things made another appearance in 4th edition about a year later, in the Madness at Gardmore Abbey boxed adventure. This was another adventure centred on the deck, and players had to collect the cards one at a time as they progressed through the adventure, with cards having lesser effects while separate, and only gaining their full power once the whole deck had been assembled. In 5th edition, the Deck of Many Things was back in the Dungeon Master's Guide, and returned to something closer resembling the deck from 2nd and 3rd edition, i.e. no longer sentient. And finally, of course, the Deck of Many Things got its biggest makeover with the release of this gorgeous box set last month. This added heaps of lore and 44 new cards, as well as loads of new spells, locations, items, characters, and organisations inspired by the Deck of Many Things. But we'll talk more about this book a bit later on. An honourable mention should go out to the official Dungeons & Dragons Tarot deck, released in 2022. Although not technically associated with the Deck of Many Things, the fact that you can use a tarot deck to represent the Deck of Many Things in-game means that these made the perfect tabletop prop to use in your games. So with that all out of the way, how can you use the Deck of Many Things in your games? The Deck of Many Things has a reputation to be the ultimate item of derailing campaigns, causing game-changing effects completely at random. And yeah, that can happen but there are a number of ways that you can rein in the randomness, or at least be prepared for it, whether you're a player or a DM. Firstly, some advice for DMs who plan on using the deck of many things in their games. If you're a player, feel free to skip ahead to the advice for players chapter. Okay, the first thing to say is that most of the effects, although dramatic, aren't actually game changing. And even the most dramatic effects from the deck are quite manageable if you're ready for it and if you're quick on your toes. A great example of this comes from Critical Role, minor spoilers ahead. Matt Mercer adapted really well when a Void card was pulled in episode 115 of Critical Role. Rather than let that disastrous effect derail the current session, he jumped ahead two weeks to a time when Grog had been recovered, and then saved that two week side quest for a future session. Bob Worldbuilder has a great video where he breaks down each card and how best to deal with it. That being said, there are some cards that you might just decide are too much for your group. And that's totally fair. Part of being a good DM is knowing your group and knowing what kind of game they want to play. So if you think there are a few cards that will ruin the game for your group, then you can just make sure they don't pull them. 
A 13 card deck is a totally legit part of the game and it gives you the chance as a DM to remove 9 cards that you think would be the most disastrous for your current campaign. As well as modifying the deck, you can also just rig the deck and make sure your players pull the specific card that you want them to pull. This could be done with a little sleight of hand, Matthew Colville has a great method for this. Or if you're using a homemade deck, you could just fill the deck with multiple copies of the cards you want them to pull and your players will still get the rush of thinking they're pulling from a completely random deck. The last trick you can use is to simply modify the powers of the cards. You could make a slightly powered down version of the deck with less dramatic consequences. If your players question it, you could explain it as the magic being faded or perhaps the deck has been tampered with. Okay, the players can come back now because this tip applies to both DMs and the players. Be smart with the timing. If you're in the middle of a time sensitive adventure with very high stakes and very little margin for error, it's probably not a good time to try your luck. The best time would be in between campaigns when the party is looking for something to do because depending on what you pull, the direction of the next campaign could be decided then and there. The other key bit of advice for players is to actually be prepared for the consequences of your actions. Yes, the DM is often more responsible for adapting when there's a sudden change in direction in the game, but remember that D&D is a game of group storytelling. So if you really want to have a go with the deck of many things, just be prepared to run with whatever happens. Rise to the challenge of a dramatic change, whether it's good or bad. It's an opportunity for great storytelling. And if you think there's a real chance that you would get upset if you had to roll a whole new character just because of an unlucky card pull, that's totally fine, it's okay to get attached to your character, but maybe don't risk it. Just let one of your more carefree teammates pull a card instead. Okay, before we get onto the low cost alternatives and ways to make your own deck at home, let's indulge ourselves for a minute and look at this amazing new Deck of Many Things box set. It comes with two books and 66 absolutely beautiful cards. The additional 44 cards serve a few purposes. Firstly, it lets us use this deck for divination, similar to a real tarot deck. The second purpose is the extra cards can be used to randomly generate adventure inspiration. And thirdly, the new cards let us use a new item called the Deck of Many More Things. This is an expanded deck where additional cards have been crafted by extremely powerful mages. The book does note that the original Deck of Many Things cannot be added to, and that the Deck of Many More Things is its own unique item. These new cards really are excellent. They have gilded edges and gold elements on the illustrations. The art is also wonderful, and each artist is accredited on their own card. Moving on to the books, we have the new card reference guide, which goes into detail about every card and explains how to use the new 66 card deck for divination or for generating random adventures. If you want to use the deck of many things as it's described in the Dungeon Master's Guide, simply remove the additional 44 cards and use the descriptions and powers found in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The other book here is the Book of Many Things, which is not a direct explanation or guide for the Deck of Many Things. Think of it as a gaming supplement that takes inspiration from the Deck of Many Things. It includes extra spells, characters, places, dungeon crawls, organisations and feats. Some directly linked and some more loosely inspired by the Deck of Many Things. This book is really good if you plan to use the Deck of Many Things in your game, as there are lots of fun ideas in here about how to tie it into the wider campaign. But even if you're not using a deck of many things, there still might be stuff in here that you could use in your game. So that's the new box set. Annoyingly, right now, the books and the deck aren't available separately. So if you want to get your hands on just one of those things, unfortunately, you're going to have to buy the whole box set. But I do think it's really worth it. If you are planning on buying this box set, then I've included an affiliate link in the description. So when you buy it, you can also support the channel. That being said, it is an expensive purchase and there are many other ways that you can include this as a physical prop in your game without breaking the bank. The cheapest and probably easiest way to do this is just to use an existing deck of playing cards as most people have one lying around somewhere. Just draw 22 cards and assign names to each one. You can do a similar thing with a real tarot deck if you have one. You can sometimes find them in charity shops or for quite cheap on eBay or Facebook Marketplace. And if you have one, you could even use the D&D tarot deck as your deck of many things. If you want to spend a little bit more money, but not as much as the whole box set, there are quite a few sellers on Etsy that have made their own deck of many things that are available to buy. I'll leave some links to my favourites in the description. These do vary in price, but they are generally cheaper than the Deck of Many Things box set. Another great option is to print out some designs and cut them out yourself. You can use the official designs from Dragon 148 or Dungeon 177, or even design your own. You can then print them onto card, but if you only have access to photocopy paper, I would buy some trading card sleeves for a couple of quid and insert a playing card, or in my case, a Pokemon card energy, in with the paper printout to give it extra strength and make them easy to shuffle. The last option is to fully make your own from scratch. I tea stained some cheap white card from Poundland and then drew on some simple designs with black felt pen. 
My art is obviously not on the same level as the official cards, but there is a certain charm to homemade props that your players will really appreciate. So there we have it. I think I've covered pretty much everything. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of this prop and I love using them in game. If you want your DM to consider using this item in your sessions, then why not send them this video? And who knows, in a few weeks time, maybe the deck of many things will pop up in your game. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe. And if you're fancy picking up this box set or just fancy picking up some card sleeves, then check my affiliate links in the description to help support the channel. And I'll see you very soon.